Hi, my name is Bill Strum, and I've had the privilege of teaching and researching at Trinity Western since 1987. My area is communication, that everyday thing we do in our conversations, emails, posts, and toasts. My favorite course is Relational Communication. This course looks at our interaction with close friends, family, and spouses. May I ask you, how are your close relationships? Would you characterize them as trusting, deep, and genuine? Or are they distrusting, shallow, and fake? No matter how you describe them, one thing is for sure. The use of smartphones today has not made us better relators. In fact, three disturbing trends say otherwise. One trend is that we're less able to empathize or feel with people around us. It seems it's easier to scroll and swipe and tap and smitey face than it is to listen deeply to a friend's complex story and jumbled emotions. So with phone use up, our opportunity for skilled empathy is down. And the second trend follows, namely, that our number of close friends is on the decline, going from 2.1 to 1.9 on average. Say what, you say? I have 800 friends on social media. Exactly. And our phones do not afford rich give and take to develop close, trusting bonds. So my cheeky question for you is, who is your .9 friend? Or, whoa, maybe you are the .9 friend. And a third trend is that social media can get us down. Why? Because when we consume social media, we're bound to compare our lives with others and try to measure up. As one author summarizes, the tendency to compare oneself with others and the desire for validation through likes and comments can lead to a distorted self-image and feelings of worthlessness. This makes sense because the online world is a curated reality where friends display their happy and successful moments. How can we ever keep up with all these Joneses? Ah, oh, but we try, don't we? I do. I post my most happy and most successful moments. Please like me. Please tell me I'm competent, handsome, cool. In short, it's not difficult to take these trends as signs of struggle. Struggle with ourselves and struggle with our friends. If that's the case, then we need to ask what kind of communication can lead us to resilience and wholeness? Or put differently, what kind of communication helps us struggle less and thrive more? One answer I've been developing for 20 years is covenantal communication. By covenantal, I mean principles drawn from God's relationship with us as described in the scriptures. And I capture six principles in this definition. Covenantal communication is the process by which people in community who are motivated by unconditional love use words and actions responsibly to create agreements that help us change for better through loyal commitment over time. Let's take a look at each of those briefly. Principle one, covenantal communication recognizes that we are persons in community. That's hyphenated. More than individual selves. Do you agree? Are you a person in community? Or do you see yourself as an individual self? As one of our scholars famously said, in the beginning was the relationship. So true. In the beginning, Jesus, the Word, was with God, the Father, at the creation of the world. And the Spirit hovered over the darkness, a perfect unity of three. And we, as creatures made in God's image, we too are in relationship 
with parents, siblings, and grandparents who shape who we are and become. Unfortunately, people of European descent, like myself, miss this fact that we are persons in community. In fact, Canadians and Americans are some of the most highly individualistic people on the planet, wrapped up in me, mine, my. I had the privilege of doing a study at the peak of the pandemic lockdown in March, April 2020. And I found that people who rated high on individualism struggled considerably more relationally under lockdown than people who rated high on group-oriented covenantal values. So whether you like the bumper sticker or not, we really are created to be in this together. Principle two is that all communication is motivated by something and covenantal communication is motivated by committed love. What motivates your kind words to a friend, your sage advice to a colleague, your praise of a partner or sibling? Most likely you want to encourage them, guide them, show value for them. By contrast, what is the motive behind the senders of spam in your inbox? Or what is the motive of the people behind pop-up ads in your feed? Or more personally, what is our motive when we criticize and belittle? In covenantal perspective, our communication is most redeeming when it is motivated by the fruit of the Spirit. We are motivated by love and joy and peace. We show patience and kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I had an opportunity to do a study on what makes a good listener. And I found that people who rated very high on faithfulness also thought that they were very good listeners, even more than if they thought themselves self-controlled or humble. And by faithful, I mean being committed, loyal, and reliable. Are you committed, loyal, and reliable? It's worth asking, what motives are behind our talk and actions? And that idea leads to principle three. Covenantal communication requires responsible use of words and actions. By responsible, I mean ethical or moral, especially in how words affect the people around us. I hope you already believe that the statement, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, is a lie. It's balderdash. In fact, our words can punch like a fist or calm like a balm. Do our words curse, belittle, deceive, and blame? Or do they uplift, encourage, bless, and heal? And related to this are the means by which we convey these words. Consider the pattern that when we are face to face with someone, we are more likely to be kind and considerate. But when we're online, we're a little more likely to be blunt and caustic. This fact reminds me of St. Aquinas' opinion that the trebuchet or catapult was immoral because it permitted killing your enemy without even seeing the whites of their eyes, therefore making them objects, not humans made in God's image. So that makes me ask, are we lobbing word bombs online that we would never say in person? A covenantal communicator uses words responsibly. Principle four, covenantal communication creates agreements for how to live together. Now, we use redemptive agreements routinely when we want to get along and help one another. Big example, some of you are currently deciding where to attend university. You're likely doing so through long discussions with parents and others close to you. And once an agreement is made, all kinds of things kick in as to where you will live, what you will do, and who will you hang out with and relate to 
for the next four to five years. However, you know, today we tend to shy from having robust conversations that lead to clear agreements. Maybe our phone gets in the way because we much rather interact superficially. Great example is in our field, we know that most dating couples never have a conversation about physical intimacy. No talk about what's okay or not, how far they can go or not. Not surprisingly, when someone crosses the line and offends, both people realize they were acting on different personal assumptions, not stated agreements. And you might say, yeah, Bill, but talking about how far we're going to make out is kind of awkward, especially early in the relationship. For sure. But compare that awkwardness with the uh, fallout of hurt feelings, broken trust, or ooh, unwanted pregnancy. Here's the deal. Talking costs nothing and it's calorie free. Come on, let's talk about it, okay? Principle five, covenantal communication changes us together. Or put differently, after agreeing on a shared vision of the future, our communication will change how we think, feel, and act. A great example of this is when students gather in groups and achieve more together than individually. In one course, students create and launch persuasive campaigns to convince others to do things like vote in a student election, or give blood, attend chapel, or get outside for more fresh air and mental health. Along the way, as group members, they bond, mature, and become more confident. They change together. And this is not really surprising. Did, did you know that the ancient roots of the word communicate are co and may, and co means together, as in the word co-operate, and may means change. When we communicate covenantally, we change together. Finally, principle six. Covenantal communication exercises long-term commitment for relational benefit. We see this principle in biblical covenants where the players were in it for life. God promised Israel his, his what? Everlasting love. Jonathan promised David his never-ending friendship and protection. Ruth told Naomi, your people will be my people. And Jesus promised us his spirit to guide us into all truth and to comfort us. And wow, the benefits remaining in a committed relationship are huge. Good science tells us people in these kind of committed relationships are more open about what's going on inside. They're more expressive, more vibrant, more companion-like. They're more supportive of people who are hurting. They find it easier to adjust or accommodate the other, even to make hard sacrifices for the good of the relationship, and be faithful. And not surprising, committed people experience more satisfactory relationships that last longer. These trends buck the wider cultural pattern to remain unattached and to be all you can be. Uh, take LinkedIn, for example. I'm on it. Huh. At this age, do I really need an advancement app? But that's what it is, right? Advancing that I can go and network for my personal gain. And while it's great to work toward our full potential, doing so may lead to chasing our vocational dream while leaving friends behind. Like Maximo in Acapulco, we may gain the whole world yet lose our relational souls. So to close, I'd just like to say, say this. At a time when North Americans continue to experience political and social fracture, as does the world, the one thing we can't afford to fumble on are our closest relationships. Developing, trusting, affectionate, faithful connection 
with friends and family will help us navigate this stressed out world. I hope the idea of covenantal calm has provided, if nothing else, inspiration towards a better way.